Okay, well, so thank you everyone for, for coming. So, so Don and I will be giving what is hopefully a, a friendly introduction to what we think about on a daily basis. So how to think about qubits and quantum circuits um, to make it less, less unfamiliar if you've potentially never had um, any introduction to these types of, of topics or algorithms before. I uh, just want to say we had help from Jan and Brandon in making these, these slides, so thank you very much to them. Um, and to start, we just wanted to provide an overview of some of the areas that, that we hope will be positively impacted as quantum algorithms and hardware continue to get better over the next few years. Some of these you may be familiar with um, or maybe have seen, you know, there's been a lot of hype uh, about the, the promise of quantum computing in the last um, year. Uh, and we, we do have reasons to think that it will have a big impact. So some algorithms you may have heard about include Grover's and Shor's, which provide speed ups over classical algorithms for search and factoring. Uh, we additionally think that there are many optimization problems that people are currently working on where quantum might have a speed up. And of course, in chemistry, materials, and physics problems, we hope, um, since these are quantum mechanical systems by nature, that using quantum resources to study these systems will help us reach systems that were otherwise classically intractable. So this is not an exhaustive list of areas we hope will be impacted, but we have reason to believe that these areas could be positively impacted with growing quantum technology, which is why, why we're here. Um, to start with, we wanted to provide just a, a little bit of a taste of why things get hard, why studying quantum systems classically becomes intractable very quickly. Um, and that's because the dimension of the, the quantum space, state space grows exponentially as you include more and more particles. So the example we have on the left here is if we have 300 quantum particles to fully describe the system becomes classically intractable very quickly. So 300 qubits requires more bits than the number of atoms in the universe. Um, so obviously that's not going to be a problem if we want to fully describe this system that we can tackle with classical resources. Um, and just to give you some taste of where we are with current quantum hardware, Google has a, a, a quantum chip that has 53 qubits. So this is sort of where we are um, with um, quantum resources. Although, as we'll talk about a little bit more, uh, 53 current quantum chip qubits are not necessarily give, a, they don't necessarily give us access to, to this, this full space because they're, they're very noisy. Um, so at a very high level, there are two things that we wanna be able to do with, with quantum computing. We want to be able to encode our data of interest in this high dimensional quantum quantum state and then have a way of controlling the evolution of this quantum state towards some some solution of a problem of interest. Um, so these um, quantum computing is just a way to encode and control a quantum state to get out uh, some some solution of interest. And this is a, a little snapshot of a picture of one of one of our quantum computers at the advanced quantum test bed at LBL. Um, which is uh, a little bit smaller than what s someone like Google has, um, but is, is something we, ha we currently have access to to um, play with right now. So now Don's going to talk a little bit more about um, sort of the basics of what we're dealing with when we talk about quantum computers. Okay, yeah. Um, I see there's a question from Lippi in the, in the chat uh, about a quantum state. So. Um, I hope to explain that a little bit better over the next few slides. Yeah. But, uh, feel free to uh, ask again if it's, if it's not clear. And feel free to interrupt me um, to, uh, at any point if something's not clear. So um, how, like in this slide, I want to give an overview of how we uh, would represent quantum data on a quantum computer. And we use something, uh, a concept called uh, qubits for that, or quantum bits. Um, and if we look at it uh, from a physics perspective, a uh, qubit is, is nothing else than a, a two-level quantum system. So the graph on the slide, it shows uh, an energy landscape um, of uh, something called a uh, superconducting uh, qubit. Uh, and it shows you um, a lot of um, 
discrete energy levels of this quantum system. And in a qubit, we basically try to isolate two of them. So these are labeled, labeled zero and one, which is the ground state and the first excited state. And we will use these to store and represent our, our uh, quantum, quantum data. If we um, look at uh, a mathematical description of what this, this, this looks like, uh, we're actually dealing with uh, two-dimensional uh, complex vectors of, of unit norm. Uh, so we can describe the state of, of a single qubit uh, by a particular vector value that the qubit has. So um, how we usually do this in, in math is we, we choose a basis of our, uh, of our, um, for our, uh, our vector to live in. And uh, um, a, a very uh, common basis is this elementary basis. So we assign the ground state to the zero, uh, one zero vector and the first excited state one to the zero one vector. And then we can describe uh, the state of a qubit as a linear combination or a superposition of these two basis states. So this is uh, one of the principles of quantum mechanics, which is, is uh, different than, than what you, you can do with a classical bit. So you can create a superposition of, of two states. Um, but uh, the, the superposition has, has to be normalized. Uh, so these amplitudes, these complex ampl amplitudes, uh, if you square them and add them together, they have to add up to one. So this is kind of the mathematical model of, of a cube that we'll be using. Um, and we can represent this, uh, this state of a qubit graphically in a picture uh, which is known as a block sphere, um, shown on the right of the slide. So here we show the zero state on the north pole of the sphere and the one state on the south pole. And any state uh, psi can be represented as a point uh, of this on this sphere. So it can be parameterized by two angles. Um, and we can... Um, evolve like an evolution of the state uh, of a qubit uh, rep, uh, corresponds to a rotation around an arbitrary axis of the state uh, on the block sphere. This is a very nice uh, and intuitive way to represent uh, the state of a single quant quantum bit. Uh, but you can't do this for larger quantum systems for reasons we'll get into later, uh, because uh, you can't separate the individual state necessarily for a, a larger quantum, sy quantum uh, system anymore. So uh, where does this model come from? Where does this mathematical description of a qubit come from? It comes from the, the laws of quantum mechanics, which this slide tries to summarize on one slide, which is a lot. If you get lost on this slide, it's not, it's not crucial for the rest of the talk, but we wanted to show a little bit about what, what all of this is based on. So uh, the state or wave function, as it's called on this slide, which is basically a, a, a synonym for, for a state, a quantum state, um, evolves in time according to uh, uh, an equation known as uh, Schrodinger's equation. It's a partial differential equation shown here. And in concept, it's very uh, similar to uh, Newton's second law of motion, which can describe um, the state of a system, of a classical system, how it evolves in time. So this prescribes how your quantum state evolves in time. And it's determined by uh, this H HT, which is uh, the system Hamiltonian. Uh, and so if we, if we assume that our Hamiltonian is time independent, we can actually solve this problem analytically. Uh, and our time evolution, so our state at time t, psi of t, is uh, given by uh, the matrix exponential of minus i h t over h bar. And this matrix must be multiplied with our initial uh, state, psi zero. And this, uh, this matrix, this matrix exponential, is always a unitary matrix. So our time evolution is a unitary operator. Um, and the, the state space uh, becomes exponentially large, like uh, Kate, Katie already mentioned in the beginning of the presentation. Um, and then actually um, the, the squared mo modulus of this uh, wave function gives you the probabilities. And we'll talk more about this uh, in, the, in, in the framework of qubits uh, in one of the next few slides uh, about uh, the probabilities and the measurement process. Uh, but first, uh, because, because uh, we're looking at unitary evolution, uh, to change the state of a qubit, we use something called a quantum gate in the quantum circuit model. So this is a graphical representation of applying an operation to a single qubit. It's shown here on the left on the slide. We have our input state gets get of psi. We apply our, our gate u and we get another state uh, out of it. Uh, mathematically, this corresponds to a, a matrix vector product with some two by two unitary matrix, which is applied to a quantum state. Um, 
And uh, this is another reason intuitively uh, why uh, the time evolution has to be unitary is because um, uh, unitary matrices are exactly the class of matrices that preserve the, the unit norm of the quantum state. Um, so that's how we, we draw a, a, quantum, uh, a quantum gate like, graphically. If you look at a specific case uh, of a single qubit gate, uh, it's, uh, we can look at a quantum knot gate. So let's first look at a classical knot gate. Uh, so a classical knot gate, uh, it's uh, probably the easiest gate you can imagine. It flips the state of a, of a single bit. Um, and it's actually the only one bit gate ex except for the, the, the gate that doesn't apply uh, anything to uh, the state of a bit, like the identity operation that you can apply to a classical bit. Uh, if we look at how a quantum knot gate looks like, this is the di diagram we use. We use either this plus sign in a circle or um, an X in, in a box. And it's uh, actually a rotation of our state uh, on the block sphere along the X axis over 180 degrees. So if we put in a state, which is a superposition of uh, zero one with coefficients alpha and beta, we get beta alpha out of it. Um, and in contrast to the classical picture, like a knot gate can take any state on the block sphere to the uh, uh, opposite state uh, rotated 180 degrees. So we can go from uh, zero to one, uh, but we can also go to the superposition on the right side of the equator of the block sphere to uh, uh, superposition on the left side of the equator. So there's more options here with just a single knot gate. And besides that, there's uh, more options for single qubit gates. So we, for example, can also apply a rotation along the z-axis of 180 degrees, which is a z-gate, and it flips the sign of, um, of one of the amplitudes, the beta amplitude, or uh, something called a Hadamard gate, which creates uh, a superposition uh, if you start from a computational basis state. So these are a few examples of single uh, qubit gates. Um, and then the interesting or the pe peculiar thing is, is that we don't have access to uh, the full quantum state on a quantum computer, but we have to access it through measurement. If we look at uh, the classical picture, if we have a register of classical bits, we can just read it out and say, uh, determin deterministically say the state of each, each bit. But uh, the state of a quantum, uh, of a quantum bit is, is an internal state. So if we uh, prepare a quantum bit in some state psi, which is a superposition of zero and one, and then we measure it, uh, we actually uh, get a probabilistic outcome. So, and the probabilities are determined by um, the, the complex, uh, the squared modulus of the, the, the complex amplitudes of the state. So we get uh, outcome zero with probability alpha squared and uh, outcome one with uh, probability beta squared. And this is a non-reversible, um, process and this destroys the superposition. Uh, so this destroys the, the information in the state in some sense uh, and collapses the wave function. So this okay. is... Uh, Can I ask a question real quick, maybe? Yeah. Uh, sure. But the, you were showing these gates and I'm thinking for of traditional gates and you can map that you know, to logic and you could design a, um, an algorithm or an adder or whatever. Is it... Mm -hmm. Can you map these quantum gates to similar logic? Like, I guess it wasn't clear yeah. to me why, you know, a particular rotation on an axis is a knot gate versus something else. Okay. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll show an example. I'll show an example later of, of uh, like, for example, uh, designing a, an adder uh, in a quantum circuit. Um, but like this, you, you can, you, this is, uh, the quantum equivalent of, of the, the classical knot gate. So it, it maps the zero state to the one state uh, and, and vice versa. Okay. okay. Um, but if, if your qubit is in a superposition, like it, it, uh, um, it, uh, it flips both of them simultaneously. So it, it does more in some sense. We had a question about that slide here. Could, would it be okay to ask? Yeah, uh, yeah. This, yeah, sure. On the previous slide, so the not gate looked like it was flipping the alpha and the beta. Yeah. But then below, right, there's like the real constraint is alpha squared plus beta squared is one. So you don't, you actually in the in the box below, you have like a sign flip, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. um, I, I mean, and, and you understand intuitively like why, but how come the top is just flipping alpha with beta and the bottom, you know, to like 
actually what you want to do is put a minus sign there. Um, I mean, it, should, about it, should, it should be the same. Maybe, maybe it's like a, a simple, maybe it's either an error on the slide or it's a, uh, it's a simplification of, of, of that result. Uh, because it looks more like the Z gate, right? Because you've, you've flipped the... Yeah, yeah, yeah the, it, it, it indeed does more look like uh, what the Z gate does. So it's, it's probably a mistake on the slide. Oh, okay. Okay, I th uh, yeah, uh, I think it's, it, uh, it's wrong. It should, it's wrong, yeah. It should be the action above uh, what the, the X gate does. Yeah. Okay. So um, so far, we we've only considered um, systems of a of a single qubit, um, but it actually gets uh, more interesting if we if we move over to, to larger qubits. So a way to describe that mathematically is if we have uh, multiple qubits, then uh, their basis state become tensor products uh, of the basis states of single qubits. So. Um, if we have a two qubit system, it can be in the zero one state. And this is described by the tensor product of the zero state of the first qubit with the one state of the second qubit. So for a two qubit system, there's in total uh, four basis states, uh, which are shown here on the slide. And these uh, in our, uh, if, we, if we stick to our choice of the basis, these actually form uh, the four columns of the four by four identity matrix. So these are actually a basis of, uh, of a four dimensional uh, uh, Hilbert space or vector space. So how this scales is if you have one qubit, you you get uh, uh, a space with, you get two basis states out of it, two qubits, you have four basis states as shown. And in general, if you have n qubits, you get this exponential number of basis states, these two to the n uh, basis states. But at some level, this, is, this isn't, this in itself isn't very different to the classical case. So if you have a single bit, you can get uh, two different bit strings out of it, with two bits, uh, a register of two bits can be in, in four different bit strings. In m, bit, in m bits, it also has an exponentially number of, of possible bit strings that it can be in. Uh, but the difference uh, becomes more clear if we look at uh, how this state can evolve through the space. So this is a very, uh, 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 this is a very uh, high level representation of our Hilbert space. Is it, this is supposed to represent a a high dimensional Hilbert space, which is difficult to draw on a two dimensional PowerPoint slide. So um, uh, it's, a, it's a representation for it. So assume we have our uh, initial quantum state of size zero, which can be a basis state. Uh, we can actually uh, evolve this state continuously through, uh, through this Hilbert space to end up at our solution. While in the classical case, uh, we are always constrained by these, these bit strings. So we, we are more. Uh, evolving our, our classical bit string on, um, on the vertices of like a high dimensional hypercube. So we're only allowed to access these, uh, these red points on the hypercube uh, with a classical uh, register of bits. While um, in a quantum case, we, we can apply the, the time evolution uh, and we can evolve throughout the Hilbert space. Um, so the, the challenge of coming up with a a useful quantum computer, uh, quantum algorithm is to uh, to formulate uh, this evolution in terms of, of a quantum circuit to do something useful. Um, and a, a very useful gate, uh, if we look at uh, multiple qubit, uh, multi qubit gates, is uh, something called a controlled knot gate. This is the prototypical gate, prototypical gate to uh, scale up to uh, from one qubit systems to uh, multi circuits on on multi qubits. So in this circuit, uh, it's a very simple circuit, we have two qubits and each qubit is a, is a line in the quantum circuit. And then the C naught gate um, is uh, the, the, the gate shown. So it's controlled by the uh, qubit labeled Q0 and it targets the qubit labeled Q1. So if the qubit Q0 is in the zero state, uh, it doesn't apply anything to the target qubit. And if it's in the one state, it applies a not, not gate to the target qubit. So it's true table is shown on the right, which, which reflects this uh, operation. So um, the zero, zero state maps to zero, 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 one maps to zero, one, because it doesn't do anything because Q zero is in zero state. And then 
if q0 is in the one state, it flips the state of the second qubit. Um, and this, this, um, this gate can actually be used to, to, uh, to do something non-trivial uh, and prepare something called, something called a bell state in a very simple circuit if you combine it with a, with a Hadamard gate. So if we uh, look at the circuit in the box below, uh, we start from uh, a state uh, in, uh, in, the, in the ground state and we apply a Hadamard gate to one of the qubits, which bring, brings it in an equal superposition. So uh, at this state, after applying the Hadamard gate on the first qubit, the first qubit is in this uh, superposition of 0 and 1. The second qubit is still in the 0 state. But if we then apply a C0 gate, um, it will um, bring uh, the total, so, uh, the, to the two qubits together in this state uh, 0, 0, in the superposition between 0, 0, and 1, 1. If you look at the, uh, the, the truth table of the C0 gate above, we see that um, we, uh, we map the 0, 0 state to 0, 1 and the 1, 0, because the first qubit is in uh, a superposition of 1 and 0. We map the 1, 0 state actually to the 1, 1 state. So we get uh, in total this superposition of 0, 0 and 1, 1 out of it. And if we measure this, um, the outcome is determined by uh, the amplitudes of that state. So there's no, am the amplitude of, of the 0, 1 state and 1, 0 state is actually 0. So we can only measure our qubits in the 0, 0 or 1, 1 stage, which means that they're actually entangled. So if we, if, um, uh, if we know the, the, if we measure, know the outcome of one state, uh, like the, 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 the state of, of, the, of the, both qubits are related to each other. That's what I want to say. So we only get uh, either 0, 0 or 1, 1 out of it. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Sorry, where's the 1, 0 state in this? It's not in there. Uh, the amplitude of that state is 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 actually zero, because. Oh, so then, how did we end up with the one one state? Uh, I thought, I we thought end up with we end up with that because at this this step, this first qubit is mm -hmm. is in is in uh, zero plus one, and the second one is still in zero. So if you look at the truth table of the C naught, we only need to look at the 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 first and the the third row. So uh, we only have uh, our or qubit ever in uh, zero zero or one zero, uh, and the first one, the first row remains zero zero. The second row becomes one one. So at the end, after applying the C naught, we get a superposition between zero zero and one one out of this. Um, isn't there a distinction between one zero and zero one? Mm -hmm. So where where if you, can you go back one? Sure. So I'm confused. Where where is the where? Sorry, where where are you getting the third line? Sorry. The third line. Like the third. Like I see you're getting it from the the table, the one zero. Mm -hmm. But where mm -hmm. where is that state? The one zero. The one zero is in the superposition. So the first qubit is in a superposition of zero and one. Oh, uh, I see. I understand. Okay, got it. Got it. Got it. Thank okay. you. Okay. So yeah, this is this is something uh, some non-classical behavior that we get here. Is it, so, is it helpful to think about this as once your your control um, channel is in in a superposition state, mm -hmm. um, you you literally you've got a not gate there. Mm -hmm. that like let's say in one parallel universe it it, it has a control of zero and in another yeah. it has a control of one so it does both it does both indeed yeah both at the same time yeah well, that's so weird <laughs> um so this slide shows an example uh of, of a quantum circuit uh for an algorithm which is known as grover's algorithm and it performs uh which can perform unstructured search uh, in, a, in a database um, quadratically faster than, uh, than a classical algorithm can. The details of, of how it work, work, works are not very important, but we wanted to uh, give a high level overview of how you read uh, a larger quantum circuit. So uh, each of the lines, uh, uh, horizontal lines, is a single qubit, uh, and each of the blocks is a gate. And you read it from left to right. So the direction of computation is from left to right. And then these, uh, these black dots are all control qubits. So we can have single control qubits like we have with the C naught, or we can have double, doubly controlled gates 
where it only acts if if uh, if both both gates uh, both qubits are in the zero state. Um, and then if you read it from right to left, you actually um, follow the direction of uncomputation or reverse computation because all the operations are reversible because all of them are are unitary. Um, so now we wanted to show an example of, uh, of uh, a very simple uh, logic circuit, uh, half adder. Uh, so we sh first showed a classical circuit, which you're probably familiar with. Uh, so in this case, we're back at uh, using regular bits, which are either zero and one. Uh, and we use uh, regular logic gates, like uh, exclusive OR and AND gates. And these can do some things that, uh, that are not possible quantumly. So they can just copy the state of a bit uh, and they can apply non-reversible gates, like the AND gate is a non-reversible gate, which is which is not possible to do on a, on a quantum computer. Uh, so this is how the circuit looks like uh, classically. And if we want to perform the same uh, summing of two one-bit uh, registers on a on a on a quantum computer, we uh, can come up with a circuit which uh, is a quantum half adder, and it looks like this. And it uses uh, it's it's basically using C nots uh, with one and two controls. And it splits out the input and the output in some sense to make it reversible. So the inputs are the qubits labeled A and B. Um, and these are either uh, uh, the zero and one bit of our classical register. And then the sum and carry are measured at the, the, the last two bits. So for example, if our, if our input is in zero, zero, all of these C nots won't do anything. And we just get that the sum is zero and the carry is zero. Um, if we are in zero one, then this uh, second C naught will be activated because this control uh, bit is, is now one and it will flip the state here and we get one at the sum. This one won't do anything because uh, the first one is still zero. Same here. Um, now, if we are in one zero, we, we flip uh, by this C naught and we get the sum out of it. And if both are one, uh, this one flips the state, this one flips again to zero, and then this one is now activated because both are, are, are one. So this is how you can read a circuit like this, um, a quantum circuit like this, um, by looking at the basis states. And it's fully reversible, uh, so everything, every operation is unitary. Uh, and by looking at these basis states, it actually characterizes the circuit completely. So if we, if we know what it does on each individual basis state, we can analyze it. Uh, we can. We also immediately know what it would do on a superposition. So it would still work if A and B are in superpositions, uh, and it would give like a probabilistic outcome of of the result uh, based on the input. So it 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 would it would act differently than the classical case. I have a quick question. Um, yeah, sure. How am I supposed to read a C not gate with two controls? Uh, you need to read it uh, as follows. Like it it will only flip flip it if both of the controls are one and otherwise it won't do anything. Ah, okay. So in, in this case, both of them are one and this, the last bit will be flipped uh, in, the, in the, fourth, the fourth case in the bottom right. Right, right. Um, uh, otherwise, yeah, so that's how you-, you So is it a little bit like you've put an AND gate between the two controls and then it's a normal C naught? Uh, in some sense, you could see it like that. Yeah, like it's, it, only, it only activates if bo both of them are, uh, are in the one state. Right. Okay. Cool. Thank you. It's, it's also called a, a Toffoli gate. Uh, this type of gate. Um, okay. And then uh, I'll uh, finish with with uh, an example algorithm before I hand it back over to Katie. So one uh, well-known algorithmic algorithmic primitive is uh, known as the quantum Fourier transform, uh, and we all know the Fourier transform as a very useful. Uh, tool to use in many science and engineering applications where you are interested in, in some frequencies and some data sets. Um, and at the same time, the, the fast Fourier transform has been one of the most successful classical algorithms of the past century. Uh, so how does the fast Fourier transform scale? Assume that we have some data vector, which is exponential in size. If we want to compute the, the discrete Fourier transform by just a matrix vector product, the, the scaling is actually quadratic in the number of data that we have. So uh, uh, we get two to the two times n if we have an exponential vector. Uh, this becomes much faster if we, if we apply FFT, the FFT algorithm to this data vector. Um, in that case, we get uh, n log n or um, uh, n times two to the n uh, for the exponential vector out of it. But if we have our uh, 
data available as a quantum state. So assume we have psi available as a quantum state and we apply the quantum Fourier transform of it. We can actually do the same transformation in n square operation. So this circuit that we need to run on it is shown below and it only contains n square gates and it will give you the, the Fourier transform of your state at the output. You still have the measurement problem, of course, that you only can access it partially, but this is uh, a very useful circuit that is used in uh, two important applications that will uh, be important if we if we can actually scale up quantum computers and, and, and get full tolerant quantum uh, machines available. One of them is known as phase estimation, uh, which can be used to find uh, ground state of complex molecules. And the other one is a Shor's algorithm, which can be used to factor large uh, prime numbers um, and basically break uh, encryption if we if we can run it at scale. And the QFT is used in both uh, in both algorithms. Okay, does, uh, do people have questions? We're gonna switch to sort of a near-term algorithm uh, for the, the end of the, the talk, but are there any more questions about the basics of circuits? I do have a question. Are you gonna talk about um, like how these gates are actually like physically applied? Like, Not, not really. Um, okay. we'll, we'll, we'll briefly touch on the different experimental systems that people use for for qubits we're not really experts on the experimental side um but we um I, I, yeah i don't know if you want to say anything more about that that done um, um yeah yeah i don't think we cover it in detail in, in the presentation okay. yeah, yeah. Um, but there are, there are many different ways to yeah. actually it depends also on the technology. There's, yeah. Uh, the, yeah. Yeah. Katie will talk so we'll, about we'll provide like a little, a very uh, superficial overview of the the types of technologies that exist, and for each of them, there's going to be different ways to to apply these gates. Um, so we've been really focused for what what Don's been talking about, sort of the the mathematical model um, of um, of how to to think about circuits. Um, but if you are interested, we can get resources for you. Um, cause we have people we collaborate with here on campus who, who are, you know, actually doing that from an yeah. experimental. Cool. That'd be great. Thank you so yeah. much. Um, any other questions? Um, I, I have one. Yeah, um, yeah. now that you've, you've shown a bunch of gates, I'm kind of curious, um, is there a way of implementing a branch instruction in a quantum computer? A branch instruction. An if statement, basically. If. Um, um, yeah, I don't think that's going to be very efficient. You Like, basically, you can, uh, there's like some mathematical math analysis that shows that you can encode any classical logic circuit uh, yeah. in a quantum circuit with some limited uh, polylogarithm, polylogarithmic overhead. Um, but that's, that's not how people usually think, I think, about designing quantum algorithms. But yeah, you should be able to do it. It just might not in be. In principle, you, you should be able to do it, yeah, but it might not be very efficient. And efficient in terms of the compilation process or then the resulting quantum circuit just won't? Uh... Yeah, that you need like additional qubits uh, to make it reversible, uh, ah. things like that, yeah. So not efficient in memory in that sense. In that, yeah, in some sense, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Can, can you talk a little more about, um, I don't know if the, you know, determining what problems uh, make sense to run on a quantum computer versus not? I mean, in that sense um, of efficiency? Um, yeah, um, like on the, the second slide that Katie showed, these are like the, the, the current target applications of quantum computers, I think, uh, like encryption, chemistry. Oh, uh, I, I guess are there, are, there, are there kind of proofs or like in the way we show that something's, you know, in, or something where you can say, oh, this problem is similar to something and, you know, it's not efficient to run on a quantum computer. Is there anything like that currently or is that? Um, there's definitely problems that are uh, hard, hard to run on quantum computers. Uh, I, so I don't know if it's obvious beforehand, like what what's going to be. So okay, so for like studying physical systems that we know are quantum mechanical in nature, like 
you know, doing time evolution for, for a molecule, um, you know, we, we have reason to believe that will be efficient because the, the dynamics are quantum mechanical. Um, so we think using quantum resources will be more efficient than, than classical resources. Something, you know, like factoring or, or search, I, I don't, I don't know the history and, and maybe you do Don, but I, I'm not sure it was obvious like from the beginning that those would have more efficient um, quantum variations or if it was just, you know, you know, some stroke of genius found them. Um, because people will do this now with even like, like PDEs, right? That you can make a quantum version. Um, and as far as I know, um, they're not better to do using mm -hmm. using a quantum algorithm, um, even though you can formulate them as quantum algorithm algorithms. So, um, you know, that's like an area of, of research for different mm -hmm. different types of problems. Yeah, Although, people are exploring all kinds of applications and and trying to come up with quantum algorithms to solve all types of different problems. Also, in in linear algebra, yeah, there's the HHL algorithm, which basically solves linear systems. In principle, faster than uh, than a classical algorithm, but um, yeah, it, it it has some assumptions, uh, and basically, yeah, like one of the big assumptions is that, or big drawbacks is that your output will be a quantum state. So um, it's faster than like uh, doing LU factorization or any any classical method I, uh, that that you like, um, but you don't have access to the full output of your your solution, so you need to do something with it or, or analyze it uh, in some way or access some observable uh, which would make yeah. it efficient yeah that was the, the okay. point of like so like don's measurement slide right we were able with these quantum circuits to store these like super high dimensional um quantum states that have all this information but then we only get out you know n pieces of information we, we can never get out the full thing when we make the measurement um so you know trading figuring out how you know you can store this information, but you only get access to, um, you know, instead of two to the n, you only get access to actually n pieces of information when you measure. That's like the other, the trick when designing these algorithms, like how do you make use of, of that? Um, yes, yeah, so I don't think it's it's obvious um, by any means, which- which oh, it's still active research. Yeah, yeah. Right, let me just check the chat if there are questions. Um, oh, they're talking about the if. Um, Um, any other questions? Okay, well, we'll have more time for them than later. Um, but next we were going to talk about algorithms people are trying to run on, on current hardware. Um, and current hardware is um, not, not the best right now. So we're approaching this, this NISC regime, which is noisy intermediate scale quantum which is something John Preskill coined um, a couple of years ago. So we have limited numbers of qubits, right? The Google example we showed was 53 qubits. Um, they're not all connected. So you have to figure out a way to deal, deal with that, which often means more gates. And there, um, there's no error correction. So we can't run an infinite number of gates. Uh, these quantum states are, are fragile. And uh, the longer you run a quantum circuit, the more gates you apply, the more likely it is to be, be corrupted by interactions with the environment. Um, but we're still, you know, we have access to these, these quantum machines, some of which on campus, and we're still trying to get something useful out in, in the near term. Um, and in particular, one of the things we're working on in collaboration with the advanced quantum testbed on, on campus is eigenvalue calculations. Um, so quantum algorithms for eigenvalue calculations. Um, and there are a few known in the literature. And if you, you have any experience in this, this field, you've probably heard of um, quantum phase estimation, which Don mentioned on the, the previous slide. But this requires this quantum Fourier transform, which requires a lot of gates and a lot of qubits. Um, there's something called adiabatic state preparation, which is also very, requires very deep circuits, so many gates. They aren't feasible for the near term. But we use these things right now called variation, variational quantum eigensolvers. So this is an example of a hybrid quantum classical method for, for eigenvalue calculation. Um, and these types of hybrid quantum classical algorithms are, are pretty popular right now because we don't expect to have fully error-corrected quantum hardware 
in the near term. Maybe, you know, maybe in 10 or 20 years, we'll have much better equipment. But for now, the question is, can we love leverage classical resources, resources in addition to what we have um, for our quantum resources? Um, and again, eigenvalue calculations, why we're interested. Um, you might have a particular molecule of interest um, whose energy landscape, knowledge about the energy landscape can give you access to designing, you know, a better catalysis mechanism. So this is, this is um, a picture of a bacterial protein that um, catalyzes the change of, of nitrogen to ammonia. So this is the Haber process, you know, takes up a lot of the world's energy production but because it requires very high temperatures and pressures and this, this protein does it at room temperature and pressure. So if we could get an accurate understanding of its um, energy eigenstates, maybe that would give some insight into designing things that could do it at um, lower temperatures and pressure. So, you know, we're interested in energy eigenstates for a number of reasons. Um, this protein, it's too big to calculate classically. Um, and the idea is, well, we can, you know, so this will have maybe order 100 electrons that we're, we're interested in um, storing in our quantum states, right? That's already becoming very intractable. So the idea with this, this type of algorithm, the variational quantum eigensolver, is we calculate this, you know, high dimensional quantum state on a, a quantum processor by applying some, some circuit that is an is our best guess for an approximation for the, the ground state uh, that also has tunable parameters. Um, and then calculate the energy through measurement and classically optimize the parameters in these gates. And there's a variational pr principle. So the lower the energy, the better in this case. Um, so this is an example of one of these hybrid algorithms. Um, so what we do is we have some, some guess, some ansatz for the, the structure of the ground state wave function. Um, and it's going to look like this, right? So again, these are qubits and there's a bunch of um, single and double qubit um, gates applied uh, to, to this uh, quantum state. And in particular, the single qubit gates are basically always rotations. So we can have some parameter characterizing these rotations, some angle. Um, so we have some initial guess for what these parameters are. Uh, then we measure the energy um, and update the parameters to lower the energies. And we're, we're classically optimizing these parameters. Um, so this is the basic structure. We have a loop between the quantum part um, that is preparing this high dimensional state uh, then we measure um, and optimize this, this cost function, which is the energy, and rerun the circuit with the, the new parameters, measure the energy again, and keep on doing that loop until our energy reaches a minimum. So there are problems with this approach, like the optimization can actually become quite costly, and uh, the, the landscape is, is um, not always the best for, for optimization using gradients. So people, people work on, you know, classically, what's the best way to actually optimize these parameters. But this is like one of the most common ways right now people are actually trying to, to run quantum algorithms to study chemical and materials systems because it doesn't require very deep circuits. Usually these, these, these guesses for the ground state wave function that make up the quantum circuit um, are, are short by necessity. Um, and you can get an approximation to, to the, the energy eigenstates of interest. And just to, so some, some proof of that, these, these are some recent, I guess, high profile papers that utilize this type of algorithm to look at um, energies for small systems. So these are hydrogen chains that Google looked at and you know they use 12 qubits. This is a lattice model, the Schwinger model that another group looked at using trapped ion qubits, only eight, uh, but they could get, you know, not great, but reasonable approximations to the ground state energies using these systems. And they, that probably sounds quite small to you, 12 qubits, that, that's, you know, obviously classically um, something you, you could do, you know, you can maybe, um, you could definitely do it on your laptop, um, but just showing proof of principle for some of these algorithms and that we have qubits that are th that are good enough even for these small scale systems that's that's a big deal right now because these systems are 
uh, the quantum hardware is actually is so hard to build and control right now, hopefully getting better. Um, so these types of hybrid algorithms, we believe, will be one of the main things people use in the in the near term to try and get quantum advantage, um, because these these sorts of like the QFT example down showed they're they're so deep that we don't expect them to be readily available in the near term. Um, so I'm just going to touch a little bit on different models for qubits, different experimental um, instantiations, I guess. And again, we're we're not experts. Um, we do use some of these systems. I think Don and I have both used superconducting qubits, um, but you know, from a from a high level where we send in a circuit and we can run it on IBM or with the advanced quantum test bed here. Um, so so we're not experts on how they actually um, you know make the gates or, or control these qubits. Um, but we just wanted to say that you can make, you know, you can use basically any two level system to make um, a qubit. And there's might be different reasons you you would use, uh, you know, just an atom as as your your model for the qubit versus a superconducting qubit versus a trapped ion, like they have different properties, different um, uh, gate fidelities, um, and some some are easier to build than others. Some require very cold temperatures, some don't. Um, but there are many different models of how to actually make a qubit. Um, and just to give you a little bit of a taste of the, the types of companies that exist right now working on this, you know, there, there are some big players like IBM and Google who use superconducting qubits. There's lots of startups too, including many here that atom computing is one, they use neutral atoms. Um, people use trapped ions, there's spin qubits, people use photons. Um, and it's, it's not clear at this point if there is a dominant technology. Um, again, they have many different properties that make them attractive for different reasons. Um, maybe some will be more scalable than others. Um, so this is a, an area that we're very interested in right now, trying to interact more with these companies and learn more about why or why not their, their hardware is good um, and scalable. And we're doing that with the, the idea that in the near future, we expect hybrid algorithms to be one of the main things people are, are running and one of the main areas where we expect there to be quantum advantage, um, meaning we can do something that we couldn't do with purely classical resources. Um, so Don and I are, are like one of our uh, focuses right now is like trying to figure out uh, how to integrate these types of technologies um, with the rest of um, the, the quantum workflow at, at NERSC. Um, and to give you an idea, even, even once we have fault tolerant quantum hardware available, we expect um, there to be many classical HPC steps in the, in the quantum workflow. So really a, quant a quantum algorithm is just a big unitary matrix. So taking that and synthesizing that or compiling it into a quantum circuit is something that right now we expect to take classical resources. People like Costin and Ed Ganis work on this the algorithms for converting um, a big unitary matrix into the optimal number of quantum circuits, you know, minimizing the number of two qubit gates or whatever is going to cause error, errors in the circuits. Running classical uh, versions of what you expect from your quantum sim simulation is something that people do right now. So you have some expectation for how it's going to run on your quantum hardware and then doing some sort of post-processing um, is also probably gonna, going to require a lot of classical resources. So even with fault tolerant hardware, we sort of expect there to be lots of classical steps in, in the quantum workflow. Okay, and then, so we just wanted to end with two things. One, you've seen this before probably because we, we presented it at the all hands. This is sort of our, our roadmap for how we expect the next few years to be with a big, you know, this is this is very super. This is you know a high level view. Uh, we expect there to be a lot of research in the near term about how to integrate with the different hardware technologies, with a view towards you know at some point we we hope that there's high performant quantum computers available for for us and our users to use, and that at that point we'll have a a good idea of how it's going to integrate with HPC, um, and just you know. There's lots of people at Berkeley Lab working in this area. You know, obviously our favorites are at NERSC. Um, 
but people working on compilation and synthesis um, and CRD, lots of people working on algorithm development, um, people working on hardware at the advanced quantum test bed um, are readily available. We have projects with them. And ESNet is also getting into this, trying to make distributed quantum algorithms um, a thing in the near future. Um, so if you're if you're interested in this area and you you want to be involved, we're we're very happy to talk to you more or put you in touch with with these types of people. Um, so yeah, that's all we wanted to say. Thank you for coming, and we happy to answer as many questions as um, you have. Let me check the chat. Um, yeah, we'll make the slides available. Um, Okay, back to the if question. Um, so I'm just reading the chat questions. So Jonathan says, what's current tractable limit for solving ground state of system classically with FCI or CCSD? Uh, how many electrons and orbitals? Um, order, I'm not sure exactly for like a full, CI, um, but I would I would guess order like 40. I don't know, Nick, if you have a strong opinion on that. Katie, this is Brian. Brian, so, okay, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know how to put this into absolute numbers, but the, um, the biggest I've seen is like a 1212 active space. So okay. in terms of like the number of uh, many body states involved. I I can't do that easily in my head, but um, it's a it's a huge number of of states. Okay. Okay. I think that the more the the more pre the more uh, relevant question is then how does that compare to say doing this hybrid classical quantum? Uh, if you were to use the limit of what you can do classically, what what would you need then to the hybrid quantum space? How many qubits and how much? How many resources in both spaces, and how long would that take relative to this gold standard limit? Um, well, so companies are aiming for um, you know fifty plus qubits right now. That being said, like no one's actually done one of these hybrid uh, algorithms. I think the latest I've seen from Google was they did sixteen qubits for for a hybrid algorithm, which is you know it's far below. Um, but that's partly because like the qubits just aren't very good right now. Um, IBM, I think, wants to very quickly scale to like order a thousand qubits. Um, so I don't have exact numbers for you, but they're, you know, they're they're building. If we had, if we had, you know, sixty good qubits, right, and could actually use them all in these hybrid algorithms, then we would we would be there. But that's that's not the case right now. So you know. Answering that question for the quality of the, the qubits we have is something like honestly Don and I are trying to work on that right now to like get like good a good like sort of benchmark for um, how good the qubits we have actually are for the, these types of algorithms. Um, so I know that it's like not complete answer to your question, but we're we're trying to we're trying to get those numbers for you. Richard, you had a question? <clears throat> I did. So um, Katie and, and Dean, great. Thanks for doing this presentation. I really enjoyed it. Um, you know, I can kind of conceptualize the most things you've talked about, but what seems to me like really magic still is um, how you actually uh, have a device that you implement the, the state that you want and how you yeah. evolve it the way you want and then how you make that measurement. And I, I guess that depends on the technology, but um, I don't know if you have any pointers to where um, additional reading for the for the. Uh, yeah, we we can definitely get you some um, because we're yeah we are not experimental experts, um, and to some degree it still seems like magic to me too. But <laughs> <laughs> they can they can do it. Um, but it sounds like based on your question and some other people's like there there is interest in in that. Um, I don't know if it would be worth, we, we have collaborators at the AQT who do this every day. I don't know if it would be worth, I mean, we can get resources from them or they could give a seminar um, if, if there, there was enough interest. Um, 
Yeah, yeah I think that would be interesting. Think I mean, they probably have it, we just, I've missed them, but it, be, it might be interesting to give a nurse focus one. Yeah, yeah, I think just like a, a very hardware specific, that would be for superconducting qubits. Right. Um, but yeah, that's something that, like maybe we can brainstorm a little bit about, Dan. Um, Sorry, I was looking at the chat. I, I, yeah. I missed the, the last question. Oh, it was the, it was a question of like getting a better understanding of really how, how the hardware is preparing these states and manipulating them. Um, mm -hmm. And maybe like a, a, follow, a follow up presentation on that topic or. Well, yeah, maybe with help from people from the AQT or something, you know, people who do it. Um, Taylor, you got a, you had a question. Yeah, we're, we're in the pipeline is the most time spent today when you're running stuff like is it compiling or running on the, I don't know, like can you kind of provide some. Um, so it, I think it also depends on the technology um, because uh, so like neutral atoms and trapped ions, their, their gates are quite slow. Um, so actually running the algorithms there on the hardware take some time right now. Okay. So I do actually think compilation takes a fair amount of time. So people like, like Costin work on algorithms to, to, um, really optimize the number of, well, two qubit gates. So two qubit gates are much noisier than single qubit gates right now. So you want to minimize the numbers you have, and you, you can imagine there are different ways um, to, to turn a unitary matrix into a series of one and two qubit gates. So minimizing the number um, of two qubit gates you have, um, there, you know, he has algorithms that will do this very well, but can be quite slow once you get to larger numbers of qubits. Um, and he's working on approximations um, so such that you know your quantum circuit is not exactly the same as the unitary matrix you want to run, but it, it's a pretty good approximation. It runs quickly, and it has a very small number of two qubit gates coming out. Um, so that that does take a lot of time. Um, to be fair, I've only run things on quantum hardware up to ten qubit. So uh, everything in that case was fast. Although, okay, so for these VQE type these hybrid quantum classical algorithm I, I've shown you, the optimization can become very costly, the classical optimization. I think that's actually, in many cases, slower than the actual running the quantum circuits right now for the, the types of algorithms um, for the scale of the systems people have been looking at. Um, so um, I don't know if you want to add anything down. Do you think there's like one area that is the most time consuming? Um, yeah, the compilation problem is I, that definitely becomes a hard problem um, because yeah, if you if it, it, it also scales exponentially, um, so yeah. if you want to scale that up, that's that's pretty difficult. And then yeah, with these these um, yeah like, like VQE, I think uh, if you want to run that on IBM, they they have some workflows available now maybe for that. Uh, but before that, it was also harder to to get that in in a closed loop with the classical optimizer, right? Um, but they have worked on that, I think, pretty recently to provide a workflow for these type of hybrid classical, uh, quantum classical uh, workflows. Yeah, so that exchange of information is something um, I like. I haven't had a problem with in the past, but because I've only like dealt with like very small systems, but I mm -hmm. think people are anticipating being a problem. Um, so there are a lot of slow steps. <laughs> um, yeah, thanks. Johannes? Um, yeah, this is actually uh, a sort of a sub question to, to what Taylor asked. Um, you were showing this um, uh, quantum classical system where the quantum computer is essentially in a loop. Yeah. Um, and, and I'm kind of curious, like, let's assume we've already compiled our problem, right? Yeah. Um, now we are doing this loop. Um, can you foresee any sort of scaling bottlenecks and also what's the workflow overhead of, of going through the loop part? Okay, so the loop part is really, yeah, so we've compiled the circuit, right? The structure of the circuit is not going to change. It's just, just the values of the, yeah. Yeah. yeah, just the parameters. Um, uh, so, I mean, the exchange of, you know, sending, we're going to measure 
some energies, send that to the classical computer and optimize, right? So this exchange of information and then update the, the parameters in, in the quantum circuit. Um, so, I mean, the exchange, sending information back and forth between the quantum and classical computer is, is something that, you know, we want to optimize. Um, so I guess I'll, I'll answer your question by saying, so the people in the AQT are thinking about this right now, the advanced quantum testbed. And one of the things they, they've thought about doing is just doing basically, so they control their quantum circuits with FPGAs. And then they're like, okay, we can just do the optimization on the FPGAs as well. Um, because they're thinking about this exact problem. They're like, if we just do it all on the FPGA, um, then it should be quicker. But we also think that at some point, the optimization is going to become maybe not, not great on the FPGAs. Um, so I guess that what I'm trying to say is like, we're trying, we're trying to figure out the best way to do this workflow now. Like, do we do everything on the FPGA um, or do we, you know, send it off to a GPU to do the optimization if it becomes complicated enough? Um, right. I think one one of the bottlenecks for for scaling this up uh, as well, and maybe a bit more fundamental, is that these uh, these optimization landscapes, if you scale it up, become uh, pretty flat. Like these gradients, there's some analysis out there that they can become exponentially small. Mm -hmm. uh, so basically your optimization it stagnates uh, in some cases and there's, there's ways around it and people have been looking at this but that's one of the challenges with these type of algorithms mm -hmm. and is it is uh i don't know is this the problem there that you can't compute gradients in on, on a quantum computer you, you can compute gradients on a, on a quantum computer um actually mm -hmm. um it's just a question of what's the best way to optimize these these parameters yeah, yeah. um Right. Okay. No. Uh, interesting. Um, 